As many of you might know, Mike Bickle was just caught in these sexual allegations, very serious sexual allegations at that, and people have came forth and explained in at least some amount of detail what has happened with them, and finally, since that moment, uh, Mike Bickle's made an official statement himself. He was first off requested to not say anything until there were some investigations done, and he's finally made a statement, so let's watch what he had to say. Hello, everyone. I hope you are well. Uh, I have a few significant updates to share. First, Mike Bickle released a public statement just a few hours ago, and IHOP KC is glad to see this public statement from Mike addressing the allegations against him. This is a step in the right direction. The statement is long and detailed, and I encourage everyone to go read it. In the statement, he admits to engaging in inappropriate behavior 20 plus years ago. He also makes a reference to occasions, plural, at the same time, he states that he is not admitting to some of the more intense sexual activities that are being suggested and calls many of the allegations greatly exaggerated and blatantly false. And these are specifically ref referring to ones that have happened more recently or uh, supposedly happened more recently. In contrast, the October 28th public statement by the lead members of the advocate group references serious allegations that span decades and that they found allegations of clergy sexual abuse by Mike Bickle to be credible. Their statement goes on to say that the credibility of these allegations is not based on any one experience or any one victim, but on the collective and corroborating testimony of the experiences of several victims. So now we clearly have two sides to this story, and this is 100% why we need an independent third-party investigation. And then they pretty much just plead for the rest of it for if somebody has a case to just admit that they have a case. There's a few things that I find really strange about this. First off, again, I don't want to criticize this guy at all. Like, he's caught in the midst of something that has nothing to do with him. So he's done nothing wrong. But, like, it seems like this guy was not even really prepared for this video. Again, really more of a side note. But he seems like he's, like, more excited and, like, has is, like, almost out of the loop. And somebody just shared this story with him. And he's just kind of sharing the story that was shared with him. Whatever. A anyways, the points that I want to make are as follows. The first thing that is interesting is the fact that somebody is evidently like straight up lying. Who is lying? Um, I don't know. Uh, Mike Biggle has humbly admitted to his moral failures. Amen and amen. It seems strange that he would try to stretch the truth and be like, oh yeah, I didn't do the, I didn't do the more recent ones, but I definitely did the old ones if he had actually genuinely done the more recent ones. Obviously, I don't personally know Mike. Uh, I've uh, listened to him. I've gone to his Kansas City uh, IHOP you know, New Year's conferences a handful of times, and I really enjoyed everything that I experienced there. But this problem is much deeper than a sexual misconduct thing. The, the thing that I want to emphasize that most people are going to overlook is his position. Mike Bickle is in a similar position as Bill Johnson is. If you don't know Bill Johnson, he's the pastor of Bethel Church. And with Bill Johnson's church, there's this kind of perception that he is like the uh, apostolic top dog of the church, and he's like the big dog leader. And for that reason, we need to respect and honor him as such. When God has put somebody in your life, I, I think that you are commanded to honor them in a very serious and sober way. Where I have an issue with this is when that, that honor and sobriety goes to a point of almost praise and worship of that person themselves. And this is oftentimes what happens with these really, really big leaders like this of really large movements who have genuinely, honestly done a lot for the Lord, some good, some bad, but have honestly done things for the Lord. Um, it, it causes a lot of, of chaos and a turmoil when we put such a, a specific individual on such a great high pedestal. And I think this is a very, very concerning problem that our churches should really address. And how do we address it? Well, we do what the scriptures say, obviously, like in anything else, where we look at what the Bible's version of church looks like, and we follow that. Well, what is that, you might ask? Well, um, it's interesting that the word pastor is mentioned one or two, depending on the translation you have, uh, one or two times in the entire New Testament. This word pastor is not very frequently used, and the uh, concept of what we have today, time as a pastor, is mentioned zero times. Not once. Not a single time in the New Testament that we have a pastor mentioned. Now, what we see happening oftentimes in our churches, somebody like a Mike Bickle, uh, somebody like a Bill Johnson, somebody like a Stephen Furtick, Joel Osteen, uh, John MacArthur, is more of like an apostolic, if you want to say anything, more of an apostolic, a, a, a movement creator, a movement starter. Now, obviously, a lot of those people would not call themselves apostles, and I wouldn't call them apostles either. 
But the point I'm getting at here is these people are the singular point of truth and reason that everybody flocks to who's interested in their church's movement. It has nothing to do with anybody else who goes to their church. It has to do with the individual themselves. This poses a lot of problems. The first problem it poses is this is unbiblical. Um, there's nowhere in scripture that we're supposed to look up to one person if his name is not Jesus and give him such praise and honor and, uh, and, and such uh, high uh, esteem given to one man. The second problem with this is when a, a leader like this does have things that they want to do or say, they can generally get more leeway than an average Joe like you or me can because we don't have that level of influence like they do. That can be good, encouraging them to read their Bible, study scripture more seriously, or that can be really bad when it's things like sexual misconduct. The third problem with this is when you put somebody in a position like that, when they do fall, and they will fall, right? Like every other Christian falls. The only difference is since this is my pastor, it's a bigger deal, which it shouldn't be. It's a big deal because they're a human being and they're falling. But when somebody like this falls, it's a bigger deal because now the entire church is devastated by this person's uh, sinful lifestyle that they've been living. So when we see somebody like a Carl Lentz uh, from Hillsong and he's found in all of this you know, immorality or whatever— same problem, same exact issue occurs where everybody is now completely devastated. People are falling away from the faith, which is really strange because I don't know what Carl Lentz has anything to do with Jesus being real or not. I don't know what he has to do at all with God's existence or not. I don't know what Carl Lentz has anything to do with the resurrection of Jesus or not. It has nothing to do with it. It's the point. Yet people are acting like it does and they're letting their entire lives be dictated. Their entire walks with Jesus dictated by what one man did or one man did not do which is really, really strange to me. So what is it that scripture commands us to do when it comes to these topics? Well, it's said that we're not supposed to have any form of uh, eldership, leadership, headship, etc. It's just not supposed to be one person. It's supposed to be a group of people. Let's, so let's see what the Bible says about this. This is in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This talks about overseers and deacons. We can go to a lot of different places. We can go to Titus on this. We can go to different places in 1 Corinthians on this. We're in Timothy right now. We can even go to the Gospels. But anyways, I just want to read a, a, a short excerpt from here. It says, it is a trustworthy statement. If anyone, uh, if any of you aspires to be an overseer, it is a fine work that he desires. An overseer then must be above reproach. Um, the husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, skillful in teaching, skillful in teaching. Why would an overseer need to be over or skilled in teaching? I thought pastors taught. Maybe nowhere in the Bible does it say that pastors teach. Maybe teachers teach. Uh, maybe overseers are part of the teaching. When we look at scripture, we see that God has given five positions, like these like uh, overarching positions, to the body of Christ. It's found in Ephesians 4.11. It says God gave some as apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, all for the working of the uh, uh, all for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. These uh, positions have been given to the body of Christ for the purpose of uplifting them, edifying them, and also giving them instruction in how to look like Jesus with the things that they're doing, with the ways that they're living. With that said, unfortunately, we have pastors who are teaching. Um, some people want to argue that, you know, the Greek word is pastor-teacher. It's like kind of one like hybrid word. But still, the principle still applies that we are having overseers, scripturally speaking at least, we have overseers who are doing the teaching, skillful in teaching. Uh, again, why would they have to be skillful in teaching if they're not teaching, right? And no, this wasn't for their Bible study, small group Wednesday, home group, et cetera, that was happening. This would have been for their, their congregations. Not overindulging in wine, not a bully, not ge or, uh, but gentle and not contentious, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll just skip past that one and act like that verse doesn't exist so that we don't have to dethrone about half the pastors probably in America for that one. Um, making sure that he manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with dignity. Yeah. Um, anyways, I'm just, yeah. If I go into a whole rant on that, I'm going to get really fired up on it. And uh, there's, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, um, if, if he can't manage his own household, then how will he handle the church of God? Um, probably not well. And not, uh, not a new covenant, excuse me, and not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into further condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside of the church so that he will not fall into disgrace from the snare of the devil. And then deacons is not going to be as much of this like, you know, top, like higher up kind of leadership position. But the principle still applies that these people are supposed to live above reproach, right? When we look at what the Bible tells us about leadership, we should not be having a single person that is... Um, 
having such a great effect on you. We should have a list of people who are having such a great effect on you. And the problem is, is when you only have a small handful of people who have such an influence, then people start unfortunately falling into uh, a, a lot of idolatry of this person and they put all of their hope and excitement and whatever into this one individual. The problem leads to all the things that I just said earlier. And again, the biggest part, yes, all those things are, are unfortunate byproducts of that thing. But the biggest thing is again, it is unbiblical. It is not biblical for you to have that one person doing all the work. So when we talk about how in churches today, the pastor is not able to disciple these people, is not able to pastor these people and whatnot, it would make sense why he would not be able to do these things because it's not his job to do all of those things. He has one job. And again, if his job is to teach, then he should be teaching. If his job is to just be pastoring people, it should be pastoring people. But for him to do all of these things and to oversee the entire church and the operations and the finances a little bit and like, oh my gosh, what, what do we have this guy in this position for, right? Let's look at the Greek definition of the word overseer, because again, I don't just want to throw words around and nitpick things. It says, uh, this is somebody who was like the superintendent, right? Specifically the Christian, uh, the office of bishop or visitation. And then when we look at the outline of biblical usage, it says investigation, inspection, visitation, the act by which God looks into or searches out the ways, deeds, character of men in order. That's obviously specifically referenced to God. Overseer would mean like oversight. Overseer, office, charge, the office of an elder, the overseer uh, that is presiding the officers of a Christian church. So when we see this concept of like elders or the people who are kind of uh, the uh, administrating, uh, managing kind of people, the people who are overlooking what's going on in the congregation, that's what a group of people like elders should be doing. And one elder can teach one week, one elder can teach the other week. And if somebody goes, well, the problem is, is that Timmy is the best or John is the best of those teachers. Well, guess what? The problem is, is the first Timothy three says that all are supposed to be good teachers if they want to be in this position. If you're not a good teacher, that's okay. You just can't be an overseer per first Timothy three. But again, when we have these issues where we just start letting people into positions and then letting them do all of these different jobs, you're setting that person up for failure. And again, it leads to this level of strange idolatry oftentimes with whoever that individual leader is, regardless of whether they fell or not. So for this specific thing, I think it's going to be really interesting to see that somebody is, is very evidently blatantly lying about the experiences that they're supposedly happening or that, that are supposedly happening here with this Mike Bickle situation. Um, some people are going to have some serious uh, judgment incurred to them for their uh, manipulation or deception or lying or whatever. Again, I'm not going to cast stones at Mike Bickle because he had something, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. Like he's a human being. He made a mistake. It was a big mistake. And uh, he should take ownership of that. And the thing, at least to the best of my understanding, I've kept up with this fairly okay, is I don't know why he was not asked to step down, at least for a portion of time from leadership when that originally happened. It's a shame that it's not till 20 years later that he's going like, ah, yeah, I got busted, but it's okay. We're over it now. It's a shame that that's something that happened and tried to be hush hush, stay under the rug. Um, but it is what it is, but whatever's happening more recently and this group that seemed to like seemingly come together all at once to like, kind of like pounce on him again, if, if something happened, like he needs to be, you know, those things need to be brought to light as it says biblically that those things need to be do. So again, I'm not, I'm not saying like, like I'm not backing Mike Bickle. I, have, I don't personally, again, I'm not, I'm not crazy over his teaching personally. I don't really listen to him very often, but like, I just think that when it comes to this kind of misconduct and people uh, accusing and whatnot, that we need to be really, really, really careful that when we're accusing people, we know exactly what we're accusing them of and that we're doing it with honesty and transparency. So again, not sure. Uh, subscribe if you want to be left updated on 